Oh Lord, so much to talk about, so little time. I'm going to beg the forgiveness of everybody here um, because I just know it's so much material and for some people it will be just too much to swallow in such a short amount of time. Lord, give them attentive ears, attentive minds. Uh, Give me the right words to expedite the thoughts straight to their hearts and uh, may you be glorified in all of it, Father. And so we give you this time dedicated to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as I said, I'm probably going to regret this. And I'm only speaking for myself. Okay, I am only speaking for myself. What I'm getting ready to tell you, I am not going to do for every one of our staff members. All right, but I know that I have so much material that I'm putting my name up here. And I'm putting my email address up here. And you're going to say... Do you have any notes? Okay, all I have are the slides that I'm presenting to you now. Every slide that I have has Bible verses linked to it. Everything that you see up here comes out of Scripture. Okay, so when you look at a a sentence that I've written, there's a passage right there with it. So I'm trying to back everything that I'm saying up with Scripture. Of course, let me see now, how many of you know absolutely that you've got the end times totally figured out? Okay, so we have a problem, don't we? Because either I know I'm absolutely right, and you're all wrong, or we're all speculating on some things, aren't we? And we try to assemble it the best that we can, and I've tried to assemble this the best that I can with Scripture. Okay, to me that's the critical point. To make sure that what I'm saying is right and it's based upon Scripture. And so we're going to be looking at something very interesting. And you'd say, life? Yeah, it's interesting. I've had enough of life sometimes. Some days are better than others. Some days are diamonds. Some days are coal. But actually, it's not just life. We're talking about life in the millennium. Okay, so we don't typically talk about that topic. Now, the problem that we've got, though, is that there are people in the millennium. Does that make sense? There's people in the millennium. Well, who who are they and how did they get there? Where did they come from? How do we know who they are? And so we have to fly through a period of time that many of you will already know about. I'm not picking on anybody, but I just would like to know how many of you understand fairly well the pre-wrath rapture concept that we teach at Zion's Hope. Just raise your hands, please. Okay, hands down. Okay, how many of you have never heard of the pre-wrath rapture? Hands up. Got a couple. Okay, that's good, and we're, we're very glad you're here. And please feel free to talk to me later on, or like I said, my email address will be up later on, and you can get all of my notes later on, okay? Um, how many of you are what you would call pre-tribulation rapturists. In other words, you believe that the rapture of the church comes at the beginning of that final seven-year period of time. Raise your hand, please. Thank you. I appreciate that you're even here. Okay? I'm serious. I'm serious. I was in your seat. I have pastored churches for, I'll say, roughly 15 years. I was a pre-tribulation rapturist. I believed in it wholeheartedly. And then something happened. I studied Scripture. (laughs) Okay? And so hopefully you'll forgive me. For those of you that are pre-trib rapturists, you'll forgive me because I'm going to go so fast that the general understanding that most of you have will get you through the terminologies until we can get into that millennial reign time period. Okay? So buckle your seatbelts. I don't think that they were... Did did we include seatbelts, David, in the package? No? All right, well, take your belt off and then fasten it to your chair. All right, so we know that there are basically certain kinds of people in the world today, and we can really say that they are composed of two kinds of people in this world. Okay, one of them is believers, okay, and one of them are non-believers. Okay, so I heard somebody say saints, yes, the people that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, okay, the people that have put their faith and confidence in Jesus Christ and in nothing else. Not your good works, not because you were born and raised Catholic. No religion in the world is going to get you into heaven. It's that simple. 
Only a relationship with Jesus Christ is going to get you into heaven. Not because you don't kick your dog when you go home after a tough day of work. Nothing because you don't beat your kids the way the next door neighbor does. Not because you don't yell at somebody. There's nothing plus a relationship with Jesus Christ that's going to get you into heaven. The only thing that gets you into heaven is your relationship with Jesus Christ. He did it all. He paid it all. There is absolutely nothing that you can do that will enhance what Jesus Christ has done. Okay, if you believe in what Jesus Christ did and you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are a believer. I heard somebody say, saint, great, you are a saint. Okay, so you you got the other kind of people though. You got the non-believers, and these are the people that are religious. They can be religious, go to church every Sunday. I go to a Baptist church every Sunday. I go to Bible study all the time, and yet they've never accepted what Christ did on the cross for them. You can have people that are agnostic, that think that because they're good people, they're going to go to heaven. They don't believe in there's really a God. My God would never do that, that kind of a thing. The people who are atheists, okay, the agnostic says, I think that there could be a God, I'm not sure. The, The atheist says there is no God, but the atheist can't prove that point, and since he can't prove that point, really he's an agnostic, all right? So he doesn't even know what he is. And then, of course, you've got the good people. My mother, she used to tell me, I know Christians, and I know that I'm better than some of the ones that I know. And she was right. She was right. She was better than some of them. And she was in this category of non-believer. I love my mother dearly. My mother lives with me now. All right? And my mother is saved. My mother is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, you've got the bad guys. You say, yeah, I know you're going to hell. Right? It's that simple, right? Anyhow, you got believers and you got non-believers. But as we look at this then, and we, we're trying to figure out how do we get from here into the millennial reign, we've got to look at the world that we're in now and the believers, non-believers that we're with now, and how do we get over there? And in order to do that, we've got to look at this outline of, of the timeline from how we get from here now to there. And it boils down to a final seven-year period of time. The book of Daniel outlines that, in particular, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. That's what they call the 70th week. And if you go and you study it, we're not going to do it now, but if you go and you study it, you realize that there's 490 years that the book of Daniel talks about there in Daniel chapter 9. 483 of those years have gone by. There's one seven-year period of time floating around out there in space someplace. It's in the internet. I don't know where it is. It just hasn't shown up, hasn't shown up yet, Okay. And so this is the seven-year period of time that we're looking forward to. Daniel outlines it. Now, he outlines it, but the details of it you can find in the book of Revelation, Revelation and basically it starts in chapter 6. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are the seven churches that we see written about in Scripture, right? And then chapter 4 converts us now into a scene that's going on in heaven, and 5, and then chapter 6 now is where we actually begin into what will be that last seven-year period period of time. So it starts then with the opening of seven seals that we see written in chapter 6, and the first batch of seals starting there are the, the Satan Antichrist onslaught. Has nothing to do, other than God allows it, it has nothing to do with God meting out any kind of wrath. Okay, this is everything that Satan can do, that Antichrist can do, to get at first the Jewish people, and then second, to get at the children of the Jewish people, which we would say are Christians. Okay, and so here we've got then these seals being popped open. And now, sir, we start to fly. Okay, we're going to talk about the white horse and rider. That's the first one that we see. Basically, that's the arrival of Antichrist at the beginning of that seven-year period of time with his minions. And that all starts basically on the confirming of a covenant, the sealing of a covenant, the agreement of a covenant with Israel and this Antichrist person, whoever that may be. Shortly thereafter, you end up with the rider on the red horse, that's sent down. This now is going to be wars and rumors of wars that we're going to see building up. Antichrist gaining his military power around the world as he starts to uh, exert his influence. Third one, black horse and rider. That third seal is popped open and you end up with famine across the land. I would suggest to you Antichrist is controlling food supplies, making sure that people are indebted to him if they want to eat. All right, And so at the same time, though, there are those that I would suggest are on Antichrist's side. Those would be the wealthy, the elite, and you don't want to hurt them. And that basically is where I'm saying that that's hurt not the oil and the wine. 
Okay, the wealthy people that are on Antichrist side. The next final uh, seal, horse and rider, is the fourth seal, and this is where pestilence and death come into it. Uh, those come in because of the power of the Antichrist, because of the war, and because of the famine, and now we have death and pestilence, in, in, in particular the Middle East, but then I think also spreading to other parts of the world. Then we pop open that fifth seal, and there we see the souls of martyrs under the altar of God in heaven. All right, these are people that died during the Great Tribulation, and I would suggest to you also before the Great Tribulation even began. These are the martyrs of history that are all underneath that altar, and then God goes and talks to them briefly. They say, when are you going to take vengeance on what's been done to us? And God says, hang on a second, take this white robe, you can't put it on yet because you don't have a new body yet. Hold it though. And there's a few more that have to come and join you. Okay, So that's the first five seals that are popped open there in that book of Revelation chapter 6. And now we begin God's onslaught. That first part was Antichrist's onslaught, and now we have God's onslaught. And it starts with a great earthquake. And it also starts with a sign in the sun, the moon, and the stars, a cosmic disturbance. And when you look in the book of Joel chapter 2 and verse 31, you'll see that that sign is saying that the wrath of God is about to begin. So that sign comes clearly before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So if you happen to be awake one evening and you see there's no moon and there's no stars and it's a perfectly clear night, and by the way, the rest of the world's complaining because they don't have daylight on their side of the world, you know that this is what we're talking about. Okay? So anyhow, this great earthquake, you're going to feel the earth shake as well. It'll be very obvious what's going on. And then we end up at this point in time being where the resurrection of dead saints and the rapture of living saints occurs. Okay? Everybody with me? All right, I know I'm going a little quickly here, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, those are verses that you know well. This is where that occurs. So now that we've gotten here, we've gotten to the place where the rapture occurs immediately after that resurrection of all the dead saints of history and the rapture of those saints that were alive at that time, who do we have left on the world? Okay, again, we started out with basically redeemed and unredeemed, right? What happened to the redeemed just now? They're gone, right? And so, what does that leave? Unredeemed with an exception. And you can see here we've got 144,000 people from the 12 tribes of Israel that are sealed with the mark of God on their forehead. So that's what you've got, and then you've got basically the unsaved there are no saved people, and I'm going to caveat again, 144,000, we know that, but there are no unsaved people, there are only unsaved people on earth. There's nobody who's saved left on earth. That's a pretty bad situation for them. Great situation for us, right? I mean, that's kind of the day we've been looking for, isn't it? And so now those guys who were under the altar of God, that altar is cleared out because that rapture and resurrection has occurred. Their bodies are resurrected. They get to put their robes on. And that's where we see a great multitude before the throne of God there in chapter 7. Now the seventh seal is opened up. We move over into chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. The seventh seal then begets the trumpets, the trumpet judgments. Again, there's the sign, the sun, the moon, the stars that says that God's wrath is about to begin. Now we're beyond that. And now God's wrath will begin. But before that actually happens, we see there's a half hour of silence in Revelation chapter 8. I would suggest to you that that chapter 8 and verse 1-ish there, with this half hour of silence, corresponds to something that occurs also in chapter 14. Those are the same event chapter 8, or 7, excuse me, and that beginning part of chapter 8 correspond to chapter 14. And I'm going to point this out to you now. So we've got then, in chapter 14, we've got three gospel angels. That's what I call them, the gospel angels that go across the face of the earth. The whole world hears what these angels are saying. The whole world, other than 144,000, the whole world are unbelievers. The whole world will hear what these angels angelic beings have to say the first one says here's the everlasting gospel what's the gospel uh guys you missed it you missed it here's the gospel jesus christ redeemed by him 
He died on the cross. He paid the price for you. You can't do anything to get yourself into heaven. Obviously, what you've done so far has failed you. How's it working? All right? Everlasting gospel. I'm sure they're going to be much better at that presentation than I was just now. All right? The second angel, immediately behind, though, the second angel then says Babylon is dead. This mystery religion, this mystery structure, Babylon is dead. You remember the woman riding on the beast? Right? She's dead. She's gone. All right, and there's another passage in Scripture in Revelation chapter 18 that says, come out of her. So there's an invitation to unbelievers to come out of that religious structure. And then the third angel says, you know what? If you take the mark of the beast, which, by the way, is actively being applied now, um, if you don't take the mark of the beast passport thing on your right hand and your forehead, that's a good thing because if you do take it, you're doomed. Okay? If you take the mark of the beast, you're doomed. No ifs, ands, or buts. They made me do it. Nothing. You take the mark, you're doomed. It's better for you to be beheaded than it is for you to take the mark. And so then what we end up with is that next verse, verse 11 to 12. In, chapter, in verse 12, it talks about the patience of the saints. Now let me ask you, what saints are we talking about here? If you've got a boatload of saints who are in heaven, they've all been singing songs before the throne of God, right? They've been praising the Lord. They finally made it to their final destination. The saints in heaven, are they under any great tribulation anymore? Do they have any reason that they have to endure under stress? No. So what is this talking about? This is talking about the saints who will be listening to the message of the three gospel angels. Does that make sense? All right, so they're going to be under uh, great suffering. They're, they have to sustain under suffering, and that's what that word patience means there, sustaining under suffering. And here I'm going to read that passage to you, and it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. On the earth, who were they? There were none. But they heard the gospel angels, and now there are some. Okay, they're starting to listen to this message of those angels. And they see, hey, Dan Hayden, Mike Weiss, Bob Hunt, David Rosenthal, Mike Ufferman, I hope, no, I know, are all gone. Where are those people? Where are those churches that were filled and there's only a speckling of people left in those churches? Why are they still in those churches? Ah, they weren't saved. They weren't redeemed. They were playing church. And now those people may even be saying, I was wrong. And now you need to listen to those gospel angels. And people will start to listen to those gospel angels. But they need to have endurance under suffering. The patience of the saints. And it said here in this verse 13, it says, Wow, I hear a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Who is it talking to? It can't be talking to the saints in heaven. They're not going to die, are they? The only ones that are going to die are people on earth. And so we've got that rapture that's occurred. We've got the great multitude left behind that are unbelievers. These angels are saying, blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth. Does that make sense? Talking to people on earth. From now on, those that die, it cannot possibly be speaking to those in heaven. They have what you call eternal life. They don't have to worry about death anymore. And it says, Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. The people in heaven don't have to rest from their labors anymore. They're already resting. And what are the labors? The labors are intense trouble, that toil of those that remain behind that, oh, by the way, the great tribulation, you remember that term? The great tribulation where there's a persecution against Jewish people and against Christians. And if you don't take the mark, guess what? That angel said, well, here. They're going to end up with some serious trouble. They're going to end up in labor. I mean, under labor, under intense trouble, under intense toil. Some of those people are going to die. Some of those people are going to die. Why? Because they don't have the mark. And one of their neighbors is going to say, I've got the mark, but George doesn't. Hey, uh, 911, i got a terrorist living here next to me. He doesn't have the mark. And they'll go and arrest him. I'm sure that Antichrist will be very benevolent, and he's going to say, take the mark, join the team, you can run free. And George is going to say, no, I can't. 
What do you mean you can't? You better know I'm trusting in what Jesus Christ did. I know that that's the truth now. And he'll be beheaded. And there will be many that are going to be beheaded. Their works do follow them. So we've got that half hour of silence where those three angels are going to go across the face of the earth. And the whole unbelieving world has heard those three gospel angels. This is now where God begins his wrath. Now, I'm going to suggest to you God turns up the heat. God doesn't start immediately with wiping people out. All right, We don't see that, but he starts to turn up the heat, and I mean that kind of literally as well, because now we end up with the trumpet judgments, and the first trumpet judgment, we've got a third of the earth that's burned. Trees and grass are all burned. Now, I would think that some people are going to die. Okay? I mean, whenever we have these wildfires around here, every once in a while somebody gets caught in them, right? When you're talking about a third of the earth being burned, I'm thinking that some people are going to die. But it doesn't say that here specifically. But I think that God is trying to get their attention. What are you going to do? You know that came from me. You know that fire didn't start because somebody threw a cigarette out on the side of the road. We're talking about a third of the earth that's being destroyed by fire. You know that had to come from heaven. Because the angels already gave that announcement, and now you know that this wrath is coming. The second angel uh, that blows the trumpet, we've got now a third of the sea becomes blood. Sea creatures are going to die. Ships are destroyed. I'm suggesting there were people in the ships, right? At least. So some of those people are going to die. But it's not as intense as like the whole world is going to die. But the pressure is being turned up. The heat is being turned up. That third trumpet is blown. A third of the fresh water rivers. Oh, what is it that people drink? They don't drink salt water, but they drink fresh water. That's a little bit more personal now, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I'm standing up here talking, and I'm already thirsty, and I'm imagining what's going to happen in this day when you can't get fresh water. Okay, so what's it say there? Now it's very specific that many men died. Many men died. So I'm seeing the heat being turned up, the pressure being put on, and people now starting to realize, I, I've got to make a choice. What choice am I going to make? And there are those that will choose for, and there are those that are going to choose against. And then we have a third part of the sun, the moon, and the stars are darkened. I don't know exactly how God's going to do that, but it says it in Scripture, and I believe it. All right. That's the first four trumpets. We've got three more to go, and the Bible then says, whoa, whoa, whoa. The next ones are the three woes. It says, whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the next three trumpets. So if the first four were bad, the next ones you know are going to be worse. Okay, and so here we go. The first woe. This is the one I can't get over. Five months of some kind of a stinging scorpion locust kind of a thing that goes around and can bite anybody at once that doesn't have a mark on them. In other words, the 144,000 are certainly safe. Yes? They've got the mark. And this brought me to a question, though. God, you've got people that are coming to faith here. You're going to let these guys go and bite them? They don't have that seal that we saw for the 144,000. And I, I mean, I asked God sincerely, show me some place where the saints who have just come to faith under this terrible time, show me some place where I can see that they're protected from these guys. Why would you... Why would you let them attack your own children? It doesn't make sense. And I searched the Scriptures. And I searched the Scriptures. And then I found Isaiah 66. Scribble a note. If we can get to it, we'll come back to that. But men are going to seek death, and they will not be allowed to die as they're being bitten by these scorpions. And I'm going to tell you, if I'm being bitten by one of these guys, I'm sure the first bite I'm going to say, okay, I give up, Lord. I believe you're really God. I believe what Jesus did. I'm not going to take the mark. Please forgive me for my sin. I would think that I would do that. But if by that point in time you don't, that's some pretty intense heat that God has been putting on people. They're going to seek death and they're not going to find it. Then we have the second woe that comes. Four angels are released, and they've got an army of warriors. I don't think these are human warriors. 200 million warriors that march side by side in perfect step, and they, there's nothing that stops them. 
It's like the Garden of Eden in front of them and it's total destruction behind them is basically what we'd see in Scripture. And they kill a third of mankind. You wanted to die? Good, now you can die. If you didn't come to faith then, then you're not going to come to faith. Basically is what we see. And here that same passage says that a third of the men were killed. Which ones were killed? The ones that did not have the mark of God. Does that make sense? Okay, the ones that did not have the mark of God are the ones who were killed. Believers were not killed. Isaiah 66, scribble that note again. Believers were not killed. And so this is talking about a third of unbelieving mankind was killed. Otherwise, it's the wrath of God coming on his own children, so it's not. Right? So a third of unbelieving mankind was killed, and two thirds repented not of their works, repented not of their sin. You are so far gone, you are too far gone. You will not be saved. Your heart is so hardened, just like Pharaoh, he had a few chances, and then his heart was hardened, and this is basically what's happening here. But notice, though, that there in that same area, in particular Revelation chapter 11, it does say that the remnant gave glory to God. So there are believers there, and they do give glory to God, But then there are those, one-third, who were killed, and two-thirds that repented not. I would suggest to you all three-thirds of them repented not. Because the only people who are not having a problem with these scorpion-like guys are the believers. Okay? And then the third woe. I was talking to somebody on the phone one day, and I said the third woe. And uh, she says, why is that third woe so bad? I mean, Jesus takes possession of the earth. And I said, "Uh, if you're one of those two-thirds that survived, you don't want Jesus to take it possession of the earth because now he's really going to be doing it in okay so up until the point of where we see the they repented not of their works and sin i would suggest you people can come to faith but at that point in time now it's basically you're locked in your heart is hard okay we now know that um, they repented not and the very next thing you see is that jesus takes possession of the earth he gave you all the time he was going to give And there's a day where he says, okay, everybody out of the pool. Okay? And so that's where we are now. The third woe. Jesus takes possession of the earth. Revelation chapter 11, starting in verse 16, it says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, they fell upon their faces and they worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. So this is the point in time at the end of the 70th week when Jesus now takes possession of the earth. He's given everybody as much time as he could possibly give, and now he takes possession of the earth. And what do you do when you take possession of land and there are people that don't belong on it? You get rid of the squatters. Okay, And so the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, these are the people who are dead Not in Christ, but the dead who are non-believers, they're going to be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants. So those people who did come to faith will be receiving their reward shortly. The prophets and the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. So here we are at the end of the 70th week. That's the last trumpet that's now sounded. This is Jesus taking possession of the earth. And now these angelic beings are saying, and now the next thing that comes is that you're going to destroy them which destroy the earth. And that's what the bold judgments are going to do. Okay? So, now that we've blown those seven trumpets, immediately after that trumpet judgment is finished, we now have 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel that are still walking the earth, right? Right? And then we've got now these new trumpet judgment believers, these people that came to faith. They didn't worship the beast. They didn't take his mark. They're that remnant who gave glory to God. And then we also have those people who are non-believers, who repented not of their works and their sin. And we saw that in that passage just a moment ago. Now, I've got to tell you, many people have died, though, by this point. Okay, The people that have died are non-believers. They died by those trumpet judgments, by the fire that came down, you know, and by the the fresh water that was destroyed, and um, the scorpion-like beast couldn't get them to die, but the next ones they did. Okay, That army of 200 million people, they were killing people, and so a lot of non-believers have died. They go into Hades, into Sheol, into the holding place that we would call hell for now. And then there's the believers. Okay, But there are believers that have died. They were beheaded because 
When Antichrist saw that there was the resurrection and the rapture, he said, I want everybody to take the mark of the beast. It may have been a program that was already underway, but now he's saying, you must take the mark of the beast. And if you won't, you'll be beheaded. Well, the thing is, for those people that are walking the earth, the great tribulation continues if you haven't taken the mark. Okay, we say, ah, you know, the rapture occurred. Great tribulation is over. No, for those people it's over. But for those who remain behind and haven't taken the mark, yet it continues. And they have to make the choice. And they're not taking the mark. Is their statement of faith that they trust Jesus more than they trust the beast system. Okay? So they're beheaded at that point in time. Antichrist's wrath continues at that point in time. And those saints now who were beheaded, they go and fill under the altar of God, would be my suggestion, a place of privilege for the martyrs. It was already cleared out once when the rapture and the resurrection occurred, for the resurrection in particular, because that's where the dead souls were of the martyrs, is under the altar. When they were resurrected, the altar was cleared out, but now you've got these new people who are martyred, and they go in and they fill. They'll come back up in a little while. All right, so now we've got the seven vials, or the seven bowls. The 70th week has ended. We're at the end of the 1,260 days, that 42 months, that time, times and half a time. Okay, three and a half years. We're at the end of that. And so with Scripture, we see it's very, very clear and concise. And yet here in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about that there's going to be an additional 30 days beyond the 1,260. It's going to be 1,290 days. Again, that's 30 days beyond the end of that 70th week, that seven-year span of time. And so that's when the bowls will be poured out. And the purpose of the bowls, like the angels say, is to bring those people who are unbelievers to terminate them, to wipe them out, to eliminate them. So now we're at these uh, seven bowls, these seven vials, and they're done very quickly. 30 days is all it's going to take. And the first one that's poured out is grievous sores. And that only goes on the marked beast worshipers. Okay, in other words, the people that have the mark on them, they're going to end up with grievous sores on them. Okay, the second one that's poured out is blood in the seas, and it says that all in the seas died. All animals, people, whatever, in the seas died. So we're wiping out, first of all, with these grievous sores. I'd suggest it's kind of a leprosy, and it just eats away at those bodies, and they end up dying from that. Okay, you've got um, the people in the sea who are dying. And now you've got the third one. Fresh water sources are totally wiped out. Okay, they're going to be like blood. And so what do you want when you have heat? You want water. What's the next thing? Fourth one that's poured out. Scorching men with the fire apparently from the sun, the heat from the sun. You're going to want to drink and you can't because all you have is blood water. It's going to do you absolutely no good. You're going to die from that. And it says there that they blasphemed God. They repented not. And this is where I'm saying by the time you get to the bowls, you are not going to repent. You are going to be wiped out. So your only chance, if you're sitting in here today and you notice that the trumpet judgments have started, you had better come to faith quickly. Because by the time you're bitten by those, those beast guys, and if you haven't repented of your sin then, your heart is hardened and you're going to be wiped out. Because Jesus is going to take possession of the earth after that, and you end up in this category here. And then fifth the angel that pours out the bowl, painful darkness is going to be on the beast kingdom, and it says that they blasphemed God and they repented not. The darkness was so thick. These people, they hate God. Why would he save them? He won't. He'll wipe them out. And then the sixth angel pours out the, um, the bowl, and the Euphrates dries up for an Armageddon army invasion that's going to be coming out of the east. And then finally, to wipe out all of mankind, hail upon all unbelieving mankind. There are literally at this point in time no unbelievers left on earth. There are believers, though, who came to faith early on after the rapture, during those first few trumpets, before you see them start to say that they repented not of their sin. Some people came to faith. All right. So now that we're done with the uh, bowl judgments, the vile judgments, only non-glorified saints are on earth non-glorified they haven't gotten their resurrection body they haven't gotten that body that says they're going to live for eternity these though i'm going to continue on here so just a moment so only non-glorified saints are on the earth it's 144,000 of the 12 tribes of israel these are the people that came through the judgments 
in particular the trumpet judgment, made the decision in the trumpet judgment, they became believers. They're the remnant that gave glory to God. These people can be Jewish, and we know that that happens in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, where it says there that the Lord poured out His Spirit on them, and they recognized the one whom they've pierced. So the nation of Israel at that point in time, uh, they ended up coming to faith. And then also Gentiles, we've seen that. So these are the earthbound population, though, that now enters into the millennium. Okay, these are the people that walk out of the ecosystem that we live in now, and they walk into a new ecosystem. And these are the people, though, they still have the sin nature of Adam in them. They're just like you and me. They can sin just like you and I do, but they're walking into the perfect reign now of Christ. No government like the United States or like Islam or like, you know, any, pick one. All right, it, it's going to be the perfect government system okay so then as far as heaven's concerned obviously only glorified saints get into heaven people that have been resurrected and raptured they're given their new body their eternal body up there in the twinkling of an eye this old body goes away and the new one is put on right we see that in first corinthians so these are the people though that were resurrected and when i talk about resurrection i'm talking about this term first resurrection we'll get into that in a moment here but these are people that are Again, glorified saints that were resurrected. These are believers from all of history. These are those that were also beheaded after the rapture. Because the Bible talks about how they will end up coming back to life in Revelation chapter 20. And it says that they come back to life. Again, here's the rapture. New believers, some get caught, they're beheaded, they're dead. But before the millennial reign starts, they are raised from the dead. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 talks about that. And it says there that they reign with Christ a thousand years. So they have to come back to life before the millennium begins in order to reign for a thousand years. Does that make sense? All right, so they're going to come back to life before the thousand years and they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. I would suggest to you then also, we've got the raptured saints who are right there with them. These are the people that were alive at that brief moment in time. They were caught up together to meet the Lord in the air along with the dead saints, right? The resurrected saints, they all meet the Lord in the air. These are the people that I would suggest to you are the ones who are going to partake in the wedding supper of the Lamb. Before the millennium begins, everybody who has been resurrected has taken part in the first resurrection. Okay, it's not a single event. It's a culmination of resurrection up until the millennium begins. Now, the Bible implies there's a second resurrection, but it doesn't call it the second resurrection. It calls it the second death. Okay, And that's going to happen at the end of the thousand years. But anyhow, these people, though, the resurrected and the raptured, are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, let's talk about life in general, then, in the millennial kingdom. Isaiah 65. This passage is great. And I'm going to fly through this, but uh, it's all going to be written up here. I've got a few words highlighted just so that we can kind of talk about things. And it says, though, that for behold, I create new heavens and new earth. Think with me for just a moment. What has the world just been through before we get into the millennium? It's been through those trumpet judgments. We've seen fire and all kinds of stuff, right? Oh, by the way, if you're talking to somebody who says that the rapture occurs at the beginning of that seven-year period of time, show them passages in the Old, Old Testament where it talks about how there's going to be fire that comes down out of heaven with the wrath of God. Okay? You, there's lots of verses that show about fire coming down out of heaven during that wrath of God. And then you tell them, in the book of Revelation, show me the first instance that you see fire coming down out of heaven. And they would, they would typically say, if they're a pre-tribulation rapturist, and for those of you that are, I know what I'm talking about because I was one, that we would, we would have said that the rapture happens at the beginning of chapter 4 and verse 1 of the book of Revelation. Well, first of all, there has to be a sign in the sun, the moon, and the stars that said God's wrath is about to begin, and you don't see that there in chapter 4. Okay. And then when you start to look at when you have to really be out of here, of course you're going to be out of here before God's wrath begins, when all the fire starts coming down out of heaven. And when you look at the first instance of fire coming down out of heaven, you don't see that until chapter 8, 
where now you've got fire coming out of heaven. That's where God's wrath formally begins. And so we have to be out of here before that so that we don't get scorched. Well, just look at what happened in chapter 7. You have a great multitude that shows up in heaven. Okay, and they're worshiping God, praising the Lord. So that's where the rapture is going to occur. Anyhow, the world has just been through this devastation of the trumpets and the bowl judgments. It's destroyed. It's had blood all over the place. It's got people that have died all over the place. It's got the fresh water that's been totally ruined. You can't eat anything. You can't drink anything. There's nothing there basically for sustenance. Other than if you were a believer, God took care of you somehow. But the earth has suffered the consequences of His wrath. What better time than to create a new heaven and a new earth? than now, as we're getting ready to go into the millennium. There has to be some kind of a reconstruction, recreation of the earth before the millennial reign begins. Does that make sense? Just to me, general logic. Anyhow, for behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing. Now, if you were at the end of the thousand years and you had a great reign, Christ has reigned for a thousand years, would that not be a a great rejoicing during? It makes sense to me that it would be. So it must not be at the end of the thousand years that this is referring to. It must be before the thousand years where Jerusalem had been invaded. The people had rejected him. And it wasn't the city where his presence was and all of that kind of stuff. And now it has become a joy because his people have come to recognize him as their Messiah. I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Again, the same scenario. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Continues here in verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. This is talking about life in the millennial reign. So what it's saying is here, there shall be no more thence, so from that point onward, there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. The two need to be read together. So what this is saying that an infant will live the full span of a thousand years. Okay, This is saying that an old man will not die, but will live the full span of a thousand years. The person that walked into that millennial reign, one of the earth dwellers, if you will, they will be able to live because they're children of God. They've accepted Christ as their Savior. He preserved them from His wrath. Now they're walking into the millennial reign. They will live that full thousand years. That's kind of cool. But I got a backache, man. I hope he'll take that away. You know? And all the other problems that go with life, some of that's got to change, doesn't it? So the lifespan will be changed to a thousand years. The body may be improved to live the thousand years, kind of like going back to before the flood. How long did they live? 973 years, I think. Methuselah, was that it? Who lived that long? I mean, a long time. So what's saying here is that an infant of days will live the full span, and an old man will live the full span. They will fill their days. And then it says, for the child shall die in hundred years. Wait, stop. I thought I just read that the infant is going to live the full span. For the child shall die in hundred years old. Okay, so you're telling me that if they're going to live a thousand years, that a person who dies at a hundred is like a child. A tenth of their lifespan. I mean, that, what do we live, 80? My mom is 87 coming up here in a few days. I mean, that would be a tenth of her lifespan. The child would be eight and a half years, nine years old. That, okay, that would be right. right. So a person who's 100 years old would be considered a child. But why are they dying? I just saw where it says that this infant or this child is going to live the full span. But then it adds, the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. The people that are dying in the millennial reign are the ones that are accursed are the people that have rebelled against God, have rebelled against Jesus Christ. So the person who walks into the millennium, they're believers, they're not the ones who are going to rebel. It's going to be their children who have to make that choice. Will we accept Christ in our lifetime as our Savior, 
or not. And if they won't, depending on their rebellion, they will be put to death. What is Christ ruling with while he's there? An iron scepter. All right, we keep on. Isaiah 65, verse 21. And it says that these people who are in this millennial reign shall build houses. Great. Uh, you're going to apparently be able to have some construction abilities now. And they'll inhabit them. So, okay, so this is not like communistic stuff where you're going to do work and other people are going to benefit. No, you're going to do work and you're going to benefit. Okay? In other words, you're going to build a house and you're going to live in your own house. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. You'll eat the fruit of your own labor. And they shall not build and another inhabit. So it's not communistic. As some people say, well, Jesus was a communist. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. And they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. A tree will just continue to grow if there's no storm to tear it down. As long as the roots are strong and they have water, trees just continue to grow. I mean, I've seen some of these live oaks that are a thousand years old, these kind of things. It's amazing. Okay, well, these people are just going to keep getting older and older and older. And it says that mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So during that thousand years, you're going to work, but you're going to enjoy it. Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve. They were supposed to work in the garden. It's supposed to be a great thing until they sinned. And then it was thorns and thistles, wasn't it? It says, They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. They are the seed of the blessed of the Lord. The blessed of the Lord are those who came to faith and came into the millennial reign. And then they are the children, the seed of them, and their offspring with them. This shows you that they are having children in that millennial reign. Not you and me. We'll be in glorified bodies that I can tell we're not making babies anymore. All right? My wife would be glad about that. All right? We only had two, and that was hard enough. Okay? But anyhow, they will be having children, though, during that time period. Okay, we keep on. And um, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Think about the Garden of Eden. Okay? And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Right? And then look at this. We do have animals there. We've got the wolf and the lamb. We've got the lion. We've got the bullock. We've got the serpents. And they're not going to hurt. They're not going to destroy. You're not going to be bitten by them. For you animal lovers, we'll go back into Isaiah chapter 11 and start in verse 6. Again, we see the wolf, we see the lamb, we see the leopard, we see the kid or the baby goat, we see the calf, which is like a young cow, we see the young lion, we see the fatling, that's like a, a baby uh, animal. We see the little child, so obviously they're having children at, the, in, at that point in time. There's cows, there's bears, the, and the, they each have their young ones. Okay, there's oxen that are there. It talks about different types of children, those that are suckling and those that are weaned. It talks about snakes, and it talks about the children playing with, it seems like all of them. Now, I, I hate to say that, but I don't see dogs and cats. Okay, I'm sad about the dog, I'm not sad about the cats. Right. But it goes on and it says, they shall not hurt nor destroy. So, well, these are going to be like before the flood. It was until, uh, until after the flood that animals had the fear of man. So we'll go back to that. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And I would suggest animals too will know that they're not supposed to be biting people and all that stuff. The whole world will be under the control of the Lord. Everybody will know what they should be doing as the water covers the sea. Ezekiel chapter 39. And it talks about in that day. So now we've come through the 70th week. We've come through 35 days. There's another 45-day span that the Bible talks about. I'm going to say that that's when there, there's a reconstitution of the earth. And as we keep going here, hopefully I'll get into some of that. I'm already, I've got so much more I have to say, and I just don't have the time. But it says here that in that day, so in, in, in that end times period, I will give unto Gog, that's the Antichrist, a place where uh, there of graves in Israel. Remember there's this big battle that happens, and there are, are the armies that are coming against Israel and against Jerusalem. And God wipes them out, and they're going to be left there on the grounds of Israel. In particular, the Valley of uh, Armageddon and other places, though, of course. And here it talks about the Valley of Passengers. Now, it's not talking about passengers, get on a horse and ride, but what it's talking about, people that pass through. All right? And I'll show you that here in just a second as well. But these are the people that pass through or pass over the land. And they're on the east of the sea. So if we're talking about the sea, probably the Mediterranean, and you're on the east of the sea, 
then yeah, the Mediterranean Valley of Armageddon, that would fit. Israel would fit. So we're talking about that area there where these bodies are going to be. And it, as a matter of fact, it's going to be so bad, it shall stop the noses of those who are passing through. It, the stench will be there. And there they shall bury Gog, Antichrist, and all his multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Haman Gog, the multitude of Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Now, we just had, though, some kind of a reconstitution of the earth. Right? A new heaven and a new earth. And yet, for seven months, they're still burying bodies. So, it's not a complete, let's, let's erase everything and give it totally pristine everything. No, uh, we want you to find those bodies and we want you to bury them. For seven months, now we're into the millennial reign and they're still burying bodies. Why would, why would that happen? Yea, all the people in the land shall bury them. So not, it's just not just a few people. It's like everybody's participating in it. And um, it will be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified. This is going to remind all of them of the day that the Lord said, I beat this army, I wiped them out, you bury them, you give me glory that you were not defeated by them, but that I defeated them on your behalf. So they will glorify the Lord because of that. And they shall sever out men. In other words, they're going to have men specifically that are going to be continually employed, passing through the land to bury the passengers and those that remain on the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the land of seven months shall they search. So this is going to be a seven-month process and perhaps even a little bit more. And so when you see a bone, you're going to put a marker on that bone and then they're going to come and they're going to bury the bones and this is going to be the city that's even there is going to be called the city of multitudes because of all the number of people that they bury. It's at this same time, though, that we have this massive return project that God institutes. And it says here in verse 25 in Ezekiel 39, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Now I will bring again the captivity of Jacob. Where was Jacob captive? We're talking about the end times. Where, well, when this army was attacking, when they were, the Bible talks about rape and pillage and, and thievery and people being taken off to slavery, all in that period of time that's yet to come. They're taken out of Israel and they're taken to other parts of the world. And so now the Lord is saying, I'm going to bring all of these people back and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. He's doing it for his own name and reputation. After that they have borne their shame. What shame? Uh, you were beaten bad. You were about to be destroyed. You almost ceased to exist. What a shame that is. Had you trusted in the Lord all along, this wouldn't have been your condition. Have you had enough? And it's at that point in time that the Lord pours out His Spirit on the nation of Israel. They've borne their shame and their trespasses, whereby they've trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land. What was it that was going on during the beginning of that first half, that first half of that 70th week? They were living in peace and safety, weren't they? But they were putting their faith in man. They weren't putting their faith in the Lord. They were drifting farther and farther away from the Lord when they were living in peace and safety. The Bible says that they, they lowered their defensive walls. And then that's when the Antichrist comes in, in whom they had put their confidence, and he defiles their temple, and he uh, begins the great tribulation against them. I brought them again from the people, so now the Lord is saying, I'm bringing them back. Them out of their enemies' lands, I'm sanctifying them in the sight of many nations, so the nations will know that these are the people of God. Then shall, I, shall they, talking about Israel, know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them unto their own land. So I let them go out, and now I'm bringing them back, and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my Spirit upon the house of Israel. Let's talk about those two things in red real quick. So when does God pour out His Spirit on Israel? Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. One of my favorite passages in Scripture. Everything is boiling down to this one event right here, if you want to say that. It shall come to pass in that day, again in the end times, that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem in the valley of Hamangog, in the land of Israel. 
He's going to destroy all those, land, all those people that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications. How is it that you have become saved? For by grace are you saved, right? And this is what happens here. When God extends His grace, God gives, He extends His power on your behalf. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? And not only that, did it ever occur to you that you could do nothing unless God empowered you to be able to do it? You know that you are enemies of God before you're saved, and the only way that you can get saved is if God extends His power toward you, so then you can choose to accept Christ as your Savior. Okay, and so the same thing here. He's going to extend His Spirit of grace to the nation of Israel, and then He's going to say, now that I've extended my power to you, you can make a choice. Will you remain my enemy, or will you accept the Messiah that I sent who redeemed you if you would so choose. And it's those people then, that day, that nation, those people that will say, boy, oh boy, have we sinned against God. He's going to ask them, say, please, will you come to me? And they shall look upon me who may pierced. And they shall mourn for him. It's like all of a sudden, their hearts are so soft. God extends his grace. As one mourneth for his only son, and the passage goes on. So now the other question was, how does God gather them into their own land and leave none of them any more there? Think about this. Where do the Jewish people live in this world? Now you're going to tell me Israel, ah, duh. All right? Where else? Everywhere, right? They're everywhere. All right? All right, so now we need to back up briefly, back into the 70th week. And we've got to remember that there was the resurrection, there was the rapture, there were the gospel angels that delivered their messages, there were new believers that were coming out of the heathen because of those messages, and then God has a mission for the new Gentile believers. Here we are, Isaiah 66. This is the passage I wanted to get to. And it says here in verse 19, I will set a sign among them. This is talking about God sets a sign among the Gentiles of the world. This was the answer to my question. How can you have these scorpion locust beasts bite your children? Show me someplace, please, where you put a mark on them too. This is it. I will set a sign among them, and He will indwell them with His Spirit. Whether He gives them the same seal that the 144,000 have, I don't know. I just know that it is now known that these people are believers. And because it's known, they will not be bitten. Because it's known when God brings His wrath upon the earth, they will not be destroyed and, and, and killed by God's wrath. They may still, though, have challenges as Antichrist continues his great tribulation. And it goes on in here and it says, and I will send those that escape of them to the nations. So now it's talking about the Gentiles who don't take the mark. Antichrist is after them. The persecution is on to get them. And they are going to escape this persecution by running away, wherever that may be, the mountains of Colorado, Montana, Lower Slobovia, you name the country. Here it names a few, to Tarshish, Paul, Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal, and to Javan. Those are all countries, I would suggest, in the vicinity of the Middle East. And then it says, into the isles afar off. Basically, if you look at the Middle East, you look at Asia, you look at Europe, that's all kind of one continent. That's where everything happens. One of the big islands would certainly be England, Great Britain. But then another big island would be North and South America totally separated. Another big island would be Australia and New Zealand. So this is talking about those places not connected to Asia, to Europe, that are all part of one landmass, to Africa. And these are going to be people, because they were not believers, that they have not heard of the fame of the Lord, and these Gentiles are going to go to them. These, keep in mind, these are the people that were left behind. They have not heard, perhaps, but now they will. 
They've already heard the gospel angels, and now they're going to have these Gentiles going and explaining to the ones that they come in contact with. These people haven't heard of my fame, nor have they seen my glory, and they shall, the Gentiles shall, declare my glory among the Gentiles. Here's your evangelists. People under great persecution who are escaping and fleeing, and yet they are going to evangelize wherever they may go, trying to get more people to come to faith. They've got a sign, though. Praise the Lord for that sign. So after God's trumpet and bowl judgments, and the new heaven and the new earth are formed. So again, these people were sealed. They're Gentiles. They've come to faith. They're going to walk through, and they're going to end up in the millennium as long as they're not beheaded, right? They're going to end up in the millennium. Now that they're in the millennium, that's after the trumpet judgments, that's after the bowl judgments, now the new earth has formed. We're here in verse 20, and it says, And they, these are those Gentiles, shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of the nations. The Gentiles, who are Isaiah's brethren? They're going to be the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, aren't they? Okay, they're the nation, the people of Israel. So they're going to find all these people, whatever countries they're in, and the Gentiles are going to bring them out of those nations. And it says, upon horses and chariots and litters, upon mules, upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem. So that's how God is going to bring all of these people who are from the nation of Israel back to Jerusalem. The Gentiles are doing it. So if you don't live there, there's going to be some kind of Uber service on horses and chariots and litters, on mules, on swift beasts that will take you back to Jerusalem. Notice it doesn't say by bird. It seems that this is all done by land, doesn't it? And so the question is, how is that possible? But this is what the Lord says, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. So the Gentiles are bringing those people of Israel as an offering to the Lord. And from those people that are brought back, I'm going to take them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. As for the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, so again now I'm saying that's why we're saying this is the beginning of the millennium. This is new heaven and new earth at the beginning of the millennium, which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. But how do you get from Chile in South America with some person from Israel back to Jerusalem by land? You don't. But you'll be able to. How many of you know of Pangea? All right, you got to go look it up. Pangea. It's my humble opinion, if there is such a thing that the land masses started with land and water at creation. Eventually, they split apart. That's why everything would fit so nice. You ever try to take you know, South America and squeeze it over into Africa? and you know, They kind of fit fairly well. You can rotate a few things, and they'll fit really well. I believe that there will be a single land mass in the future. Partially, during that 45 days maybe, when the Lord will pull things back together before the millennium and after the trumpet judgments, or the bowl judgments, excuse me. It's some speculation on my part, but I've got some other verses if I ever get to them. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. So apparently in this time now, in that millennial reign, it seems that we set aside the Julian calendar, we set aside the Gregorian calendar, and we might return back to a lunar calendar. Because it's talking about the new moons, it's talking about Sabbaths, and so our timing will change on things, it seems. And all flesh will come to worship before him, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. Okay, so now we're back in Israel, aren't we? And we're back at the time, immediately at the beginning of that millennial reign, and they're looking for all those bodies. And so that's all mixed together here in that same time period. Okay. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse related to Jesus. I'm sure we go back into that time period which shall stand for an ensign. How many people were in the Navy? Any Navy? All right. When you went off the ship and you came on the ship, you would turn toward the flag that was on the back end of the ship, on the stern of the ship. You would salute it. 
That flag is called an ensign. Am I right? Am I right? Okay, that's called an ensign. It's a flag. And we unite under the ensign of the United States of America, in theory. So there's going to be a flag. Um, when I was in the military, I was in the Air Force. It wasn't so much in the Air Force, but more in the Army. How many of you were in the Army? All right, in the Army, you were part of a unit, and the unit had a unit flag. You know, Bravo Company of the 27th Infantry, and I know I'm getting that way wrong. We don't talk like that in the Air Force. All right, but you would have a flag, and you would know that, you know, that's where your group was going to meet. Okay, and so this is what it's talking about. There's going to be some kind of a, of a, a place where people will go to, and it shall be the Gentiles that are going to seek after that ensign. It's going to be the Gentiles that are going to be going after that, and their, their rest in that ensign, in that root of Jesse, will be glorious. And it shall come to pass that in that day, again, now we're talking the end times, that the Lord shall set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Again, we're repeating the same story. So I know the Lord intends to bring his people back. He's bringing them back out of the Gentile nations. He's bringing all those people, the 12 tribes of Israel, back to their land. From Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the other continents. And it shall be said as an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Verse 15, and the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. Okay, now I'm talking about this tectonic plate movement. I'm talking about water being formed around the landmass so that everybody can get back to Jerusalem that's supposed to go up and worship, that's supposed to bring those people from Israel back to Jerusalem. They have to be able to get from, from land to land. They can't do it over water. And here it talks about that that water is going to vanish. Okay, he's going to destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. What is the tongue of the Egyptian sea? We're talking about the Red Sea. Okay, and you've got two ears, if you want to call them the rabbit ears. Remember that? Left-hand side, that's the Gulf of Suez. And it leads to the Suez Canal. And the right one is the Gulf of Aqaba. That's the one that's at the southern tip of Israel. Those are going to go away. What's the purpose of them going away? It says it here. He's going to shake his hands over the river and another part of, the, of, the, of that area, smite the seven streams to make men go over dry shod. So there's not going to be water separating land masses, at least not in this area, so that people can get back to Jerusalem as they're supposed to. He's going to make a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. Okay, the land has specific divisions. North to south, it's... Uh, going to be, well, first of all, there's a river of healing that comes out of this land of Israel. And it goes like from up northern part of Lebanon all the way down to Egypt. The, the borders are going to be there uh, of the land. We're going to see a distribution for the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. There's a portion that's for the priests. There's a portion that's for the sanctuary. There's a portion for the prince. And the city's going to be named the Lord is there. We're going to have all of this kind of division that's occurring there in this area. And so basically it's going to look like this. And you can see right over here that there's a special part right there in the middle, and that's where the priests are going to be, and that's where the sanctuary is going to be. And then you've got all the tribes from north to south. They're each going to have their, their piece of property. Now, this does cause a problem for me. I know there are some of you that are much smarter than me. Maybe you've figured this out. But I'm going to go based upon what I see in Scripture. There's this thing called the New Jerusalem. The book of Revelation talks about the New Jerusalem. It's the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. And it says that it comes down out of heaven. So it's not on earth now. It's in heaven. It's where God dwells now, as far as I understand. It's going to come down out of heaven. And so there are several references to it. There's a new heaven and a new earth. So this is the beginning of the millennium. And it's where then I see that this new Jerusalem is going to come down out of God from heaven. Of course, God's wiping away all the tears, new, all things are made new, and I'm, I know I'm zipping through this, and I know that there's um, the one thing that it talks about, that there are those who are going to inherit all things, and the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, are going to have their place in the lake of fire that's going to come later on. Okay, but I want to get to an area here. In verse 16, this is talking about the New Jerusalem. And it talks about that this city, again, coming down out of heaven, it's four square. So it's four sides at its base. 
the length is as large as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12 furlongs, excuse me, furlongs, excuse me, 12,000 furlongs wide, 12,000 furlongs long. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So this is going to be something fairly large. So as we're looking at this, a furlong is about 600 feet, depending on whose research you believe. And then you do that times 12,000, you end up with 7,200,000 feet. Okay? And then you do that math divided by 5,280, which is how many feet there are in a mile. And you end up with 1,363.636363. You get the idea, right? That's how wide, how long, and how high this city is. Okay, so you got 1,300 by 1,300 by 1,300. That's pretty massive. So here we are now. We're in the Middle East. Everybody recognize that map? All right, where's Jerusalem? Point at it. All right, yeah, that's where the red dot is. Good job. Somebody's got a laser pointer out there. Anyhow, so Jerusalem's there. All right, so if we plop that city down here, and um, the new Jerusalem, if we plop that new Jerusalem down there, um, it's going to be over apparently over Jerusalem because it's coming down out of heaven, right? Now, we do have a problem, though, in my little diagram here. I mean, it's square. That's good, all right? But Jerusalem, I mean, Israel, well, that's actually, the square is too small. All right, so you're going to take this new Jerusalem and you're going to bring it down out of heaven. But that one's too small also. Uh... So, no, no, that one's too small also. Um, that one's too small by 63 miles. Okay, that's 1,300 miles square. Okay, so keep in mind now, it's coming down out of heaven. So certainly God can have a city come down out of heaven. You don't have to build it from the ground up. It's coming down out of heaven. So there's all those measurements, 325, 650, 975, 1,300 square miles, and it's still bigger than this. So basically, if you were going to plop it down, and if you were going to put it on land, it's going to be that size by, based upon those measurements. Now, what would that look like, though, if you were to look at it from, the, from outer space? So here we are, and that far edge, I've got Israel right on that far edge, so that we can see what it would look like as it sticks out. So here would be how high it is from top to bottom, in other words, north to south, 1,300 miles. And then how far it sticks out into space, 1,300 miles. Now, it could be a square, a cube. The base is a cube. But it could also be a pyramid shape. Okay, we don't have anything definitive. But no, my, my problem is this. I just showed you another map that shows the 12 tribes of Israel. And I showed you a map there that shows that there's a place for the sanctuary. And you're going to take this city and you're going to just drop it right on top of that. I'm going to cut a lot of stuff out right now and just go from my memory. It says that there's no whoremongers, no liars that are going to be able to go in there. This is where God, as I understand that the Father lives. Okay? Well, the priests that would be in there, if you plop it down on those priests, they're inside the city. But they can't be, because no liars, whoremongers, and all the other stuff are allowed in there. Okay, and I don't mean that, I'm just saying, sinners are not allowed in there. Okay, sinners are not allowed in there. And yet it said that there was a, there was a temple structure, a sanctuary structure. The simple solution, since this did come down out of heaven, is that it's what Marv Rosenthal calls a chandelier city. Okay, in other words, it stays suspended in the air. Right? God the Father dwells there. Jesus rules the earth from Jerusalem. There's a part of that, which I didn't get into, but there's a part of it that's intended to be um, the place where there's an administrative area, there's a city area, there's a part that's for the, the, apparently the ruler of, of Israel, it's for the prince, and different things like that. And so I would suggest to you the simple solution is that God has a chandelier city. Okay? Now, the thing is, it says that, God, uh, the, that the kings of the earth bring their glory here. Who are the kings of the earth that they can go into this glorified city, into the presence of God? 
I mean, aren't the people who are dwelling on the earth sinners? So who are the kings of the earth that are able to go in and come out and bring the glory of the nations there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who else is on the earth at that time? you got glorified people who are on the earth. And what is it that you and I are doing at that time? We're reigning with Christ. Jesus rules, we reign with Christ. We're glorified. Guess who the kings of the world are, the earth are? Glorified saints. They, I would suggest, like Jacob's ladder, remember that image Jacob had where the angels were going up to heaven and coming down and what they call Jacob's ladder? It would seem to me that it would be like that. It's where glorified people would have access to that chandelier city and then non-glorified people would have access to Jerusalem city on earth to come up and worship as the nations will worship each year as they're supposed to. Folks, I've overextended my welcome. Right? I've gone way, way too long. I'm probably going to be fired when I get back. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Maybe that'll help. All right, David. They're, they're, David, either they're very kind or they're saying don't fire me, one or the other. All right, anyhow. Um, there's so much more that can be said, okay? But that's just a small sampling of what goes on in the millennial reign. I mean, there's so much good stuff. Please study it. It's really exciting stuff. Okay? And uh, for those of you that disagree with me, that's fine. Because I don't think I've got it all figured out. And I would just bet that maybe you don't either. All right, let's close in prayer. Oh, Father God, I thank you for the patience of the saints here this, uh, this afternoon. Lord, help us to see, help us to understand. Help us to figure out the details where we're wrong. Help us to make corrections where we need to. Um, We want to get it right, Lord, but we want to do it based upon Scripture, and so I'm grateful that we even have Scripture that we can look at. And so now, Father, as uh, we go with the remainder of our day, I know that we're supposed to have a break now and um, be able to enjoy some free time. I pray, Lord, you'd give people safety, protect them, um, make the weather be comfortable for them if they're going to be outside and about. And uh, watch traffic, Lord, for them, and bring them back later on this evening as well. And I just thank you, Father, for your precious love and for the great things that we see that you're yet to do and that we can even be part of it. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.